With our quiz coming up over chapter one, Beninga, hopefully you've taken a look at the exercises at the back of the chapter. In case you haven't, or in case you're having any problems, I wanted to work the first two in this video to give you a head start. In the first problem, we'll treat it basically using the Excel functions. And in the second problem, we'll build out a spreadsheet of numbers. We'll kind of give you an example of how the two different approaches to these problems can work. So in the first problem, we are offered an asset for $600 that will cash flow $100 for each of the next 10 years at the end of each year, which is important. We need to know that if the discount rate is 8%, should we purchase it? So if the NPV 8 is positive, then yes, we should. Then we're asked what the rate of return is. And if the re rate of return is greater than 8, that would mean a positive NPV and that we should also purchase it. So allow me to set up the problem. So perhaps the most straightforward way to approach this problem is to calculate the present value of the future cash flows using the PV function. We know the discount rate. We know the number of payments. We know the size of each payment. We know that there's no ending value. So I'll just hit comma and move on to type. And we can either omit this and PV will assume it's at the end of the periods or we could type a zero to tell it it's the, at the end of the periods. Let's type the zero. Notice we had to have the empty comma before the zero so it wouldn't mistake the zero for an FV, a future value. And I get a negative value. So I'm gonna go back and just for aesthetics, change that payment to be negative. And then PV will give me a positive value. And I wanna compare that against the initial cost. And since the present value of future cash flows is greater than the initial cost, then I would say yes. We could also calculate the rate of return using the rate function, which requires the number of payments, the size of the payment, the present value, which I'll have to enter as negative. I'm going to hit F2 so I can back up within my formula using the arrow key, type the negative, use the right arrow key, and then what I need to type is zero. And we don't need an initial guess because we don't have multiple rates of return here. We want to show additional decimal places. So I'll hit Alt H zero. Let's format this as an output. Alt H J. Now notice I've told it here that the zero indicates end of period payments and I think we did the same thing up here. Uh, in practice we really don't need to include the zero because that's the default input so we don't need the extra commas. We could have gotten by with three inputs in the PV and down here we could have gotten by with three inputs in. so we'll leave that a bit simpler than it was. Now that's probably not the most typical way we'd approach a problem like this. Often we would build out a table where we indicate our years and our cash flows. The first one being the negative of the initial cost. Everything after being the annual cash flow. Put an absolute value on that. You can copy, control down, control shift up, paste. And this is much like the one we did in class. Uh, then we could use the NPV function. with our discount rate and our series of cash flows. Oops, series of cash flows. We don't want that $600 to be discounted because it occurs at time zero. So we'll grab the PVs of the future cash flows, which incidentally should match this 671. And then we'll add in the negative cash flow at the beginning. We have to pull it out of the NPV because we don't want it discounted. And since when we see that the NPV is positive, Alt H A R, then 
again, we could give the same answer. Yes, PV of future, future cash flows is greater than the initial cost, or the NPV is positive. So yes, purchase. And this time, we would be able to use the IRR formula. HAR. IRR of the cash flows. Alt H zero. Alt H J show those as outputs. And this may be the more typical way of doing it, but notice we get the same answer either way. Moving on to problem two. In exercise two, we're looking at a five-year loan with annual payments. We don't know what those payments are. We'll have to calculate them. We know the loan amount, so let me set this problem up. We have three inputs, Alt H J format is input. Then we have an annual payment. It's not asked for in the problem, but I consider that an important output, so I'm going to go ahead and format that as an output. We don't know the annual payment yet. There are two ways we can get it. We could use the PMT function to calculate it, which we'll do in a moment. But let's do it the hard way and guess a payment and then use goal seek to find the true payment. So if I were going to guess a payment of $10,000 loan for five years, it's going to be something a little bit larger than $2,000 to account for interest. And then we'll build out a loan table with our years. We'll want a beginning principle, the payment size, the interest portion of the payment, the principal portion of the payment, and the ending principle for that year. The beginning principle is, of course, just $10,000 for the first year. We'll not copy that anywhere, so we don't need absolute references. Uh, the payment will always be whatever is in C13, so we do need an absolute reference. The interest portion will be the beginning principle of that year times the periodic interest rate. Notice we'll lock the interest rate so it doesn't move when we copy it down, but we do want the beginning principle to refer to the appropriate year. So that's just a relative reference and an absolute reference. The principal portion is the payment size minus the interest portion. So whatever doesn't go to interest from our payment is left over to go to principal. And the ending principal is what we started with minus any principal that we paid down. The beginning principal for the next year is just the ending principal for the prior year. We don't want to lock that. If we got our absolute references correct, all of these should copy down correctly. So let's check them. So the beginning principle in year two is the ending for year one. The payment for year two is C11, which is always our payment. The interest portion in the second year is our periodic interest rate times the second year's beginning principle. And the principal portion is whatever's left over from that payment. And the ending principle is our beginning principle less whatever principle we paid down. We can now copy those down. Uh, if we had a lot of lines here, it might be easiest just to double click on this. But we could also control V, control C, control V. Now, if we had guessed the correct payment, this would be zero. We still have some balance remaining at the end of five years, so we didn't guess the correct payment. We could add, we could start making more guesses and see how close we could get. You probably don't like sitting through this, so oops. We could just go to Goal Seek, Alt AWG. Let's actually get on this cell first, Alt AWG, and set that cell equal to zero by changing our payment amount. And we find that the payment that gets the loan paid off in five years is 29.83 and some change. And I told you before we could have used the PMT function to calculate that payment. Had we done that, we would have initially calculated using that rate, that number of payments, and that initial present value. 
the loan we wanted paid off at the end, so we would have said there's no remaining balance, no future value in the PMT function, and we want the payments at the end of the period, so zero is the default, just like in the previous problem when we used FV and rate, PV and rate. This should give us the same answer, 2983.16, and it does. Now it's negative because we put a positive loan amount in there. We make that one negative and get a positive answer out. We could also, like we did on the last one, delete these optional arguments. We know that they're optional because they're in brackets and we'd still get the same answer. Now if I wanted to put that cell over here in C11 uh, where our table is looking for a payment, might be tempting to just control X, control V, but look what happens. All these guys that were looking up here for the payment say, hey, something stepped on top of that cell I was looking at. Uh, I can no, I no longer know where my cell went. The way we can get around that, let me undo, would be to come in here, hit F2, control A to copy everything, control C, control A to select, control C to copy, and then escape and go back over here. Then F2, control A to copy everything, control V to paste in our formula. And so really what we've done is we've gone back to C11, and in that cell we've typed this formula for PMT. We're just getting it off of our clipboard. So when we hit return, then nobody down here is upset. They say, okay, all you did was change the formula that I was looking at. Somehow in Excel, if we paste a cell on top of another cell, it gives us that reference error. But if we paste that formula inside that cell, then it doesn't give us the error. So we can delete this, and I believe that we have answered the question.